I want to welcome you to today's NTCA Roundtable Live. I'm Mark Heinlein with the National Tile Contractors Association. Today is January 13th, 2021, believe it or not. And this is the first of many programs we'll be having this year. Uh, we will have an average of two roundtables every month. And we are glad that all of you are joining us today. Today's topic is submerged installations and we've opened up the waiting room and everyone from the waiting room is on their way in. Come on in, feel free to uh, turn on your camera. We'd love to see how you're doing today and we're glad you found the time to spend with us today. Very glad to have you. Um, as you come in, I want to uh, announce our guest, our guest host, and he'll give you the, less, the rest of the instructions for what we'll be doing today. And our guest host today is Mike DeGiusti. Mike DeGiusti is NTCA's Region 8 Director, and he has a company in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Hi, Mike. How are you? Doing pretty good. You ready for me to take off? Ready for you to take off, Mike. Okay. Uh, for those that have not looked at the or don't have the NTCA's applications, and it's on page 156 and for however many pages. So that's a lot of the stuff several of the people on this committee to our program today was on the committee that put this together. And of course, that goes along with the TCNA handbook of P601. Um, so from there, I guess Mark has a few slides he's gonna to show to get some things going. If you have questions, you can either raise your hand or just put it in the chat room and we'll see what we can just uh, answer and just whatever you have to ask about, we can answer. That's right. And I do want to mention that we have uh, several guest panelists today from major setting materials manufacturers. And I'm going to just tell you who they are really quickly here. Uh, they are available to all of you today to answer questions and explain what we're looking at. And maybe as I call your name, you can raise your hand. Uh, let's start with Brett Moni from Mercrete. Hi, Brett. Uh, Jill Bignolis from Ladacrete International. Hi, Jill. Hey, everybody. Hello. Mark Penine from Ardex. Hi, Mark. Arthur Minty from Lady Creek. Hi, everybody. Uh, then we have uh, Mike Michalizzi from Custom Building Products. Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. Jim Whitfield from Mape Corporation. Hi, Jim. Hey, guys. Uh, Greg Shad from Tech HB Fuller. Hi, Greg. Hey, folks. Thank you very much for all of you helping us out today. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Um, so those are our setting material manufacturers. And since we have a large audience, I do want to introduce Rob Roderick uh, with the NTCA. Hi, Rob. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Glad you're here. And Randy Fleming with the NTCA. Hi, Randy. Hi, Mark. Hey, everyone else. Rob and Randy will be monitoring the chat screen. So feel free to use the chat and Rob and Randy can um, to speak with you there and bring your questions to the group if you'd like to comment that way. So let's go ahead. I'm going to bring up a, a photo just a little bit at random for our team to discuss. So I'll be sharing my screen and let's start with this one. So that's a photo I sent in and it's, it's just a, a pool. <laughs> I took this picture when I was with another manufacturer, but it's a pool at a residence um, in, uh, say, Eastern Colorado. Um, it looks really nice there. <laughs> what, what exactly are we seeing there, Mike? Is there, I'm sorry, Jim, is there anything that stands out in particular? I sent a few pictures in from this pool because there's a lot of issues. And the biggest one, there's two major ones. The biggest one is it lacks movement joints. There's a soft wall tile on the wall, uh, soft, white body tile on the floor and the deck, if you might, and then uh, glass mosaics uh, throughout the pool and they're all shattered. And it doesn't look like it there in this picture. It actually looks very, very nice, but um, I did send a few other pictures in that we can, we can see that a lot better. It lacks movement joints, it, period. Um, they tore out 
Yeah, there's an example in the wall. See the crack running down that tile right there. Um, and that's not underwater. You know, that's that's sitting up. There's an area where they put in uh, the drainage into a slab and they poured new concrete and they didn't do anything to treat that either. So there's cracking on both sides of the, the drainage. So it, 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 it is common, I understand. You know, there you go. That's a great example on both sides of that. It just cracked right through it and that's on the floor. So, I mean, just a shame because you know these people spent a fortune trying to get this done and had a beautiful designer idea when they started um, only to, you know, eventually have me come out and look at it and say, you got problems, big problems, and it's not gonna hold up well. You know, I, I got the call to come out there because the glass mosaics weren't staying on and, and it was just bizarre. It, and, and you'll see some more pictures on that, unfortunately. There's latex leaching, which is common throughout that pool meaning they more than likely filled up that pool very rapidly after when they got it done. And the, think about latex, you know, and think about, a, a, for instance, a gallon jug of latex. If I took the lid off it, and left it exposed to the air, eventually you'd come back and there'd be rubber at the bottom of it or, or latex for that matter. It would just be uh, a solid material, not all of it, but as water evaporated. So when you think about powdered latexes and liquid ones added to mortars, or grouts for that matter, you know, they need time to cure, to become a solid again, especially when you think about the dry ones. So this is what happens when you fill up a pool or submerged application too quick. And I see it everywhere I go. I see it in fountains. I see it, you know, all submerged applications typically have a line of latex right at the water line. But this is at the pool. I mean, at the, I'm sorry, at the bottom of the pool. Um, and very common throughout it. That's just an example of some of the glass mosaics coming out. Also, if you really could, it's tough to see in this picture, but it's cracked to, it's really pretty bad. There's a lot of cracking going on through there. Um, again, no movement joints and glass mosaic. It's also probably one of the most unattractive setting jobs I've ever seen, but that is not what I was sent there to comment on. Um, so again, just a shame. Uh, some, somebody spent a ton of money on this. Hey Jim, it's Brett Monty. Um, you brought up a good point there and I, I get a lot of phone calls on this as a manufacturer, um, and I remember this job, um, is what is that, you know, I guess I, I get a lot of people asking what that time limit is. If I install tile underwater or not underwater, but it's going to be in a submersed environment, how long do I need to wait before I can put water in that area? Are you going to answer that, Brett, or do you want me to? <laughs> for me, for, yeah, you know, for me, I'd like to get everybody's opinion on it because everybody differs a little bit. Um, to me, I'm always going that 28 days. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it varies on what your, you know, your application, if it's interior, if it's exterior, if you're sitting in an aquarium, for that matter, like this building was, right? They were totally enclosed in the middle of Colorado, I'm sure probably in the winter, and all the windows are closed, et cetera. It didn't cure very well. And I don't know how long they actually let it set. I do know they did not let it set long enough, but I would tell you generally 21 days is adequate with most mortars and rapid setting you certainly could do in 14. Um, you know, some of, sometimes we'll promote some as quick as, as 72 hours, but um, I'm with Brett, you know, you certainly need to be a minimum of 14 days to, to, to as much as 60 when it comes to latex modified materials and make sure that that's latex, if you might, becomes a solid or rubber again to be beneficial. And it's not still emulsified in water, so it comes out. Here's another good example of a job up in Aspen. Hey, and, hey real quick, can Jill's uh, had his hand up to comment on something there. Can we go to him? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a note that typically for, for cementitious grout, we tell people to wait 14 days. Uh, if it's an epoxy grout, we tell them 10 days. But I also want to emphasize the uh, fill rate. You know, after that 14 days, you want to fill that pool at about an inch an hour. So about, you know, two feet for uh, 24 hours, just because the expansion that happens when you're filling the pool can be tremendous. Typically on a 50 meter pool, that pool is actually going to expand almost a half an inch just by filling it with water. So having all the materials being completely cured is very important and filling at the correct rate so that it doesn't blow out everything, especially when there's a case with no movement joints. 
that's it. That's all I had. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Again, you're seeing a picture of, of a, a, a large hot tub in a hotel in Aspen outside, of course, and lack cure time and just a phenomenal amount of salts coming out of it. Uh, Jim, can you explain for all of us, just so we really understand what that white stuff is that we're seeing there? What, what is that stuff? So you're seeing a couple of things there, actually, and, and that's where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, the easiest way to talk about efflorescence, if you might, is, is soluble salts. So that means if I, if I, for that matter, wet it down, it typically kind of goes away, right? Because it's soluble. And it's in the alkali that's in cement, and then there's a water, uh, a water-soluble alkali in cement. And if it doesn't cure properly or it gets, you know, really soaked early, sometimes they'll come to the top. You see it more, more frequently in grout. Latex leaching is a different animal. And that's what you see on that back wall where it actually looks like diluted paint coming down through it, if you might. And that's not the same. You can wet that down and it'll stay there. And again, that's just latex coming out with the water. So it's a solid, when it hits the air, it wants to become a solid again. But when it's in water, it doesn't. It just becomes part of latex. So you're seeing a couple things going on there, unfortunately. Okay. That and, help? Yeah, that does help, Jim. Thank you. And and the the easiest thing to help prevent this is cure time, right? Yeah, so, correct. Cure time and, and, I, and scheduling. And yeah. uh, another, this is uh, Mike McLizzy. Another issue that we see a lot is these exterior applications aren't protected. So... Yeah. You can get rain or snow. So you've done a beautiful job. Everything's perfect. And then you get rain on all your materials before they set or before they cure. And as Jim was saying, you get all that latex leaching out. So protecting it, um, you know, for a period of time afterwards, also important. Very, very, very important. One of the things that, that this is Greg Shad, one of the things that we've seen that's correlated to the efflorescence in these kinds of jobs is there's actually voids between the tile be and, and the mortar behind the job. So water can enter behind the tile and you actually have liquid behind that tile that can cause uh, the salts to become soluble and then out comes the efflorescence. So very often if we see this type of thing, we'll see that the tile doesn't have a, uh, the coverage that we'd like to see. Great point. Um, Jim, I'll bring up this other picture. I think this is the one you thought you were going to see first. Um, oh, I thought I had it here. Sorry about that. This one right here. So that's that same pool. Again, it's really a, a fairly attractive job. Unfortunately, it's a disaster. And again, I, I, I sent these the, the first one and this last one in here really to give you an idea. I mean, this is somebody's home. They spent a fortune on this. And it's a farmer, by the way. Um, you know, look at the ceiling in that room. I mean, my goodness. And it was a terrible, terrible installation. Terrible. Um, while we're on the point we talked about control joints a while ago, because I see we had a comment about it. Can you touch briefly, whoever would like to respond, on the requirements of control joints throughout the pool and between the deck or coping and the pool itself? And the diff, you know, we're not talking about expansion joints because that'd be through the pool, but more of the soft type joints. Michael, can you speak closer to your, your microphone or your computer? It's very hard to hear you. Well, maybe you need hearing aids. Well, I can hear everybody else. Maybe I blocked you out. There is that. <laughs> I'll mention, I'll, let me comment on it a little bit. And, and one thing I really want to stress is that glass mosaics, like you see in this pool, are extremely expansive and, and, and far more than ceramic and porcelain, et cetera. So, you know, it's really important that we do allow for that material to expand and contract pools, once they get equalized, if you might, are filled, they're generally not much of an issue. But the water line, that's where you'll see the failure first. Um, first couple times of draining it, refilling it, you'll start seeing more issues. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, the, movement, the movement joint requirements, if you might, which means for control joints as well as, as actual movement joints, are no different than they are 
for the tile industry itself. Um, you know, in a submerged application it should be every eight to 12 feet. And I do agree with some of the comment, commenters that uh, in the notes, we don't see it very often in pools, but uh, unfortunately the reason I see pools is because they failed. They don't call me out to look at good jobs. I, I've yet to get one call to come out and hey, come check out my excellent job. It just doesn't happen. Um, so we go out and look at a lot of failed installations and it's unfortunate. Uh, you, in, in this one, again, this is really not one that, that this is exceptionally bad in my opinion. Um, even the black walls, as you saw initially, but they cracked. I mean, it's just, it's a shame, but uh, pools are, pools can be different. They're a challenge you know, and protection, uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, is, is essential, especially in some weather. So depending on where you're at, I've done pools in, in, in Hawaii where, you know, they sit in three inches of water almost all the time because it doesn't ever stops raining in Hilo and some of those other areas. Yes, sir. Uh, let me comment real quick on the one with the one by one mosaics that you saw on the wall. Um, that was on a large pool in, uh, in, in a school in Hilo, Hawaii, as I said, it, it pretty much stays submerged the whole time because it rains and rains and rains. But more important with that job, unfortunately they used a B-notch trowel and it didn't bond. Oh, that was uh, that last one. Okay. Yeah, the whitish one. Yeah, uh, let me bring that up one more that time. Was one. Right there. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. just a B-notch trowel. And even at that, they didn't beat it in enough to flatten the bees. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's one thing about adhesives, and I think I can say this for all the manufacturers on the call. We work best when we are in contact with the tile and the substrate. Yeah. yeah, and um, if I could add something to that, Jim, um, one of the things that we've seen on these glass mosaics is um, contractors are going to beat the tile in with a rubber float. So when the rubber float gets wet and you start beating it in, Such unfortunately, it. sometimes it causes a suction. Yeah. So when you're beating it in and then you're pulling the, the float off, it literally can cause some voids under the tile. So you have to be careful when you're using your float. Um, to make sure the tiles are flat and beat in, that it, it's not too wet. Yeah, th that is a, that picture there just uh, speaks volumes. It's a uh, shame. On coat coverage, it's a true shame. I mean, again, this is a large school. I'm telling you, this is a big pool, and it it it, it had terrible coverage. Chris Kane. Yeah, I wanted to mention. It's been mentioned about protecting the pools from rain and snow. I think it's also important to mention protecting it from temperature as well, especially the outdoor pool. You know, everybody wants their pools for summer. So when are pools done? Winter, spring, maybe the fall. And even if it warms up during the day, what's happening at night? Um, so it's important to monitor that, not only when you're working, but the period before, during, and after the install has to be you know, within range for the temperature as well. Good point. And Chris, what would that temperature range be operating normally? Well, it depends on the product. Um, you definitely, you know, want to be above 40 in all cases, really. Um, and sometimes it could be above 50 or 60. And at the same time, you don't want to be too hot either. So usually not over 90. You know, just some general rules there. You know, like I said, it all depends on the product. And, um, you know, it's important, even though it might be 50 or 60 air temperature when you're at the job, you know, what was it over a night? You know, so is that substrate in the 20s? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and Jim was talking earlier about, I mean, we're looking at some efflorescence or maybe, maybe some latex leaching. And one thing you need to be careful about related with temperatures is that uh, as temperatures get cold, the cement slows down and the polymer in the cement also, the, the coalescence, the, the ability of the, of the polymer to, to form a film slows down also. So if you're doing uh, early spring or, or later in the fall jobs, be very careful and very mindful that to, to 
keep the tile warm as you're installing. So you let that cement reaction happen and you allow that those the, the polymer to coalesce. Okay. Um, I would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, shift over to um, something provided here by Mike McLizzy. Let me uh, see if I can get this up on the screen for you. Here we go, sorry. Shift gears just a little bit. Are you able to see this? That mic sounds? Yeah. yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> so this was the most challenging one that we had um, last year. Uh, it was a Hearst Castle uh, pool out here in California. And if you know, you see some, these are some beauty shots, but if you flip down a couple of the shots there, um, Mark, um, as you can see, um, they were leaking 5,000 gallons of water a day from this pool. And that was the biggest challenge along with, they had some cracked stone and that they had to accommodate. So, you know, all of the things we've been talking about are real critical, you know, being able to um, protect the surface um, and keep the water from, from going. All of the penetrations when they used the waterproofing, they had to be really careful because they had this, you wouldn't believe the elaborate um, system that they had directly below the pool that monitored all of the filtration and the water flow. Uh, the engineering underneath this pool was amazing. Um, and so the other thing that they, that they was critical was, and this is funny, the stone that was inside the pool, the pitches were not correct. So they had some areas where, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't flowing properly, but the, um, uh, historical society said that these contractors had to do a topography of the entire system and reinstall all the stone exactly the way it was, right or wrong. So that's, that's what they had to do. So they had to map this whole thing out. Um, but the critical aspect here is, if you see in these series of pictures, the guys took real care to make sure they had good mortar coverage. That was one of the big concerns that they had. Like you see here uh, in the top right picture, every stone that they put in, they picked it up to make sure that they had good coverage. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Because they were so, you know, I hate to harp on glass tile, but glass tile has become um, very popular and, and it's used a lot in the pools. And what we're finding is um, there have been failures due to the resins that are used um, in order to um, in order to put the sheets together in order to bond. And so what you run into is um, as the pool goes underwater, some of the glues that they use to adhere the mesh um, just start to dissolve or start to react um, in the pool environment. And the next thing you know, your tiles are failing. Um, people send in tiles for us to test so that we can do bonding tests and do them in an immersed area. And we look for reactions like this. But you know, one of, the, one of the first things that we do when we receive these samples is we take the sheet and we put it in a bucket of water and we leave it in a bucket of water for um, probably five days, five work days, check it on the following Monday and see if the tiles stay well adhered and see if there's any reaction. So I would suggest strongly that if you have any uh, mesh mounted tiles you're gonna use in a wet area, that that be the first thing that you do. Also, um, if you can look at this uh, drawing, you can see that the, um, the resin covers the entire back of the tile. So you're actually bonding to the resin, you're not bonding to the tile. And the other thing that um, is not, may not be commonly known is that when the um, film or that resin is uh, applied really thick on the back of the tile, it can actually be a flexible material. Now that you've got like a flexible plastic sheet on the back of your tile and due to movement in, inside the uh, in submersed area, 
um, you can actually have the lamination of the tile due to the fact that the film is too thick. We've done bond tests with different tiles with resins on the back and resins that are applied very thin. We can get a really good strong bond strength to them. The ones with a really thick buildup of resin, your bond strength is diminished like um, could be up to 90% reduction in bond strength. So it's something just to be very aware of. Anytime you have a mesh, um, do some really good testing, send it into your manufacturer that you like, uh, have them take a look at it for you. And before you have to go through the nightmare of replacing it. Hey, Mark, can I jump in a second? Yes, sir. Um, there's some nice chatting going on in the chat uh, screen. So anyone out there that's participating, if you have some questions, while everyone's talking, go ahead and type in your questions because they're being answered at a, some pretty good answers. Okay. Um, so the, the other thing that I'll add to that is um, uh, some of the sheet uh, mosaics are bound with a very flexible mat material uh, between the tile. Um, the, the chemistry of chlorine uh, water and pools and those kinds of things can have uh, can attack some of these materials and cause the failures that was that Mike was talking about. So you need to be very careful about um, what particular tile you're using. And someone asks where these tiles are coming from. I think we all know that the the knockoffs that uh, people purchase out in China have been a major issue, not just for glass tile but for Tiles claim to be porcelain, but they're really not porcelain. And then they're installed in a wet area and they warp um, and have, um, you know, absorption rates that are not at 0.5%, but more like 10 to 12%. Um, and so they've been a real issue. So anytime that you get something outside the country, it's something to look at um, and consider. But I would say anything that's mesh mounted um, put it in a bucket of water. That's your first test. And then if you want, contact your manufacturer. Most manufacturers are more than willing to take a look at the tile for you and give you some feedback and, and help you through the project. And, and note that the larger the glass tile, the higher the risk because of that, that thermal expansion component of glass. So the, lar the larger the glass tile, the more the risk. Also add something just, just to piggyback what Mike is saying and what Greg is saying. ANSI 137.3, right? The glass tile standard for, for glass in general now has a submerged a methodology to evaluate if a glass tile and glass mosaics are suitable for submerged applications. So Mike gave you all the, the tips on looking for that, but there's an actual ANSI standard for it now. And it's a, it's a submerged application that's an extended type test. So you could even ask your glass manufacturer, do you have 137.3 certification for this glass to be used in submerged applications? And, and that usually is a good qualifier too. We're talking so much about bond to the tile you know, it goes the other way too. I've seen where uh, a waterproofing that's not approved for pools, uh, where the mortar doesn't bond to it. And the, the instance I'm thinking of was a waterproofing that was made for parking garages and it actually repels water and it's not meant to have a topping on it. So when you put the mortar into it, the waterproofing was rejecting the mortar. So they set the tile and then the next day the tile was at the bottom of the pool because it didn't fully bond to the waterproofing. So it's important, you know, I usually tell everybody to use the system, you know, so that you know that it can be bonded in both directions. Yeah, systems are good and, you know, there's, um... Like I think what you mentioned there, we run into this a lot where uh, polyurethane membranes are specified by waterproofing consultants and they don't realize that they're very um, flexible and you may get an initial bond, but over time 
uh, a lot of the uh, installations over polyurethanes have failed. And the only way to really accomplish that is with a sand broadcast or rejection. And now you're bonding the sand. So um, a lot of these projects, if you can get in on them ahead of time, before the waterproof consultant comes up with a product that's not compatible, um, you can make some good suggestions and help them to use something, you know, as you said, a system of products that's proven and tested to work in that kind of application. Jean-Pierre Violas. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize Greg's point with the expansion of glass tile. It may actually be a good idea to uh, increase the frequency of movement joints when you're working with uh, glass tile. Everybody in the just setting material them. world on the phone. Um, I think what Chris was talking about, if I'm not mistaken, is crystalline waterproofing admixtures. And do you guys have any position on crystalline waterproofing additives used in concrete? Yeah, if it's uh, prepared right, Dave, um, it's no issue at all. If um, a lot of times they recommend sandblasting the surface. Uh, sometimes there's a chemical treatment. And with the crystalline waterproofing, there's two types. There's one that's applied afterward and one that's added into the concrete. Um, and the manufacturers of those products typically have a, um, a procedure for prepping the surface where you can get a good bond. And um, for decades, uh, all different manufacturers um, have been successful over crystalline. And keep in mind that the pool specification in TCNA has colloidal silicates in it. I mean, it, it's not required by any means, but it's listed there. So having a silicate additive, a specific one, uh, is not uncommon in pools. I, I guess my point is that your normal tile guy is not going to be cognizant of this particular issue. You know, and, and they run into it too late. They come back with it smooth wall that's you know been treated with whatever and you know down to the bottom you go i just that's the point i was making yeah. oh you're right it definitely Absolutely. needs some surface prep before you can go over it yeah hey, the, sur the surface applied materials are, are more of a bond breaker than the admixtures correct john perulis jump on in sir hey before you before you jump in there i Bart put a question up there and Art Minty answered it. And I was wondering if Bart could actually ask that question and Art could answer it live to everybody. Okay, John, we'll go to you after uh, this. Yeah, absolutely. My point uh, was that Art had mentioned 137.3 and asking the manufacturer to support, uh, to, to, to support that. And my point was a lot of the discussion was on mosaics coming from China and other countries, and many of those countries might not have that data. What's the contractor's next step if there is no data available to show that it meets 137.3? And so th that was to Art. Right, so so Bart, that's a great question. So we, we've gone down this path and had that posed to us many times. If, if the glass manufacturer is reachable, we will encourage them to get that sort of testing done at the tile council. And some of them have, they've complied with that and they've been good results. When, when you don't have that ability in the absence of that, you can work with your adhesive manufacturer to try to coordinate that type of testing if time allows, because it's a pretty lengthy test. So you got to get into the queue at the tile council and you, and you have to allow enough time to get the results. So if the parties are cooperative and you have enough time, you can certainly get it done at Tile Council. Uh, I've actually haven't run that glass test. How much is that test? Um, so I don't, I don't have the, the price offhand, Dave, but it, I don't think it's more than, than $1,500, I don't think. It's, it's pretty reasonable when you really think about it and when, when your risk is much greater. Yeah. We should point out that, that TCNA doesn't discriminate. Contractors can have that test done as well. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, absolutely. if you don't want to wait for the manufacturer, you can go have it done. 
that was actually uh, I was actually kind of heading there, Dave, and I appreciate you bringing that up because the, the consumer or the builder or someone may be willing to pay for that or 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 uh, partner on that in order to be, you know, very, very or the distributor that's trying to sell that product if they can't produce that information, someone might be willing to help pay for that so that we can all feel better about this installation. I I guess I also think if there's no if we bring it up and if there's no data, you know, then they know they're at risk from day one. Um, that's my thoughts so on it. Dave, Dave or, or Art, do you know what the turnaround is? Brad Denny was asking, what is the turnaround to get that information if you were to submit a tile to the TCNA for that? So, so they're- Get in line. Yeah, that, that's it. So that's there, first. Is, there is- there is test a, one, two. There is a- there is a period of time there, right? You, you have to have the samples have to cure for 28 days. The ANSI test is 28 days. And then you got to get into the queue, right? So whatever tile council's backlog is. So it, it could take, it could take several months here. So that's why it's not a solution for, for everything, you know, for time sensitive, you know, projects it might not be a, a viable option. As far as the queue goes, there's a sliding scale on the queue. If you pay the wrap rate for the test, then you get in the line. And then I don't remember whether it's 50% and 100% or whatever, but then there's a sliding rate that they will, you know, if you take the rack rate and you double the rack rate, they'll start on it the day they get the tile because that way they have the means to pay the extra time to take it out of their queue because that's in essence what it goes for. So uh, you can adjust whatever time they give you, you can adjust that, but you have to pay more for it. Just getting in line, but you, the testing still takes the 28 days. Yeah, it still takes- You know, for the cure and the days. setup and, and, and that's important. If yeah. you got two months in line and you can just- right. Pay three thousand instead of wait two months and another oh, two God. months. Yeah, um, I submitted a like photo it. of a, 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 a sculptural tile fountain I did a few years ago using the Latticrete's Mviz system, and uh, the cement contractor set up the pool portion of the fountain with uh, crystalline cement, and. Uh, I went over that with three quotes of, I guess it's uh, a, a different type of uh, hydroban that comes with the Latticrete system. It's a heavier duty thing. And I didn't have any adverse bonding issues with that or uh, failures. Uh, the grout system that I used with uh, the Envis system uh, hasn't cracked or leaked. So I don't know if that answers people's question about uh, going over crystalline grout. Uh, I, I haven't had an opportunity to test uh, uh, Redguard uh, with a similar type thing because I haven't had a fountain since then, but I uh, thought I'd mention that. And also uh, getting back to the glass uh, issue, I had problems with a custom cutter that I use in uh, Santa Rosa it has a high pressure water jet cutter for cutting intricate uh, designs out of stone and glass. And every time I gave him glass tile from Ansax, uh, it snapped. And he told me that uh, they pull the glass from the kiln too fast. Uh, and, and, uh, unlike uh, glass that's made in the USA, and that was an issue. And uh, someone, uh, uh, he, uh, Brad got back to me on uh, NTSA re reference manual on glass tile, but I find it difficult to work with some designers once they have it in their head to use a certain product. And I say, hey, well, look, you know, uh, sometimes they don't even check with me, you know, and uh, I've even given some designers our manual, you know, the NT NTSC manual. And uh, I, I don't know if there's some way to outreach them. I don't, I don't know if they have a trade association, but I see that's an area that needs some attention. Maybe Bart, uh, can you describe a little bit of our outreach to that, that part of our industry? Well, you're never, I mean, you're never going to, 
be able to solve providing education to all of these designers, John. Um, there's there's so many of them, and they have their own association. But uh, by all means, uh, I think we have a responsibility to uh, provide uh, tools to give you to give to give back to your customers, but also for us to provide education uh, to designers uh, to designers. Because often a distributor like an ANSAC is not picking on them in particular, but they're not looking for functionality not of, looking. of performance. They're looking for the products that are beautiful that are going to be uh, bought by consumers. So they don't always look for the back end of a will is, you know, until they have a problem that goes with cement tiles. Uh, you know, all this new stuff sometimes is doesn't have um, the testing behind it and you you're going to need to require that. But Mark's point is, we're starting to do some work as a group to try to provide consumer education. And when we say consumer education, that means designers, builders, other trades working with our product to, so that they know that we're a resource so that they would have access to our reference manual to read about glass tile, for instance, when they're going to do a glass tile project. That's a responsibility I think we're, we're gonna to try to really take seriously in the next 12 months. Right. The other, I have a suggestion too, Bart. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers have um, architectural reps who can speak their language. So, if you run into those issues, you can you can contact your manufacturer and get them to connect with the architectural rep, their technical rep, um, and they can help you overcome some of those issues. We've done that a lot in the past. And if uh, you have that issue, uh, you can get in touch with our technical team emailing us at technical at tile-assn.com. And one of the things we do is we can steer to manufacturers that would be appropriate for that person, uh, just like Mike said. Uh, I, I do want to get to some more of the photos that were submitted. And Art, let's get into your photos now, if that's all right with you. What are we looking at there? Okay, so I, I just wanted to highlight how there are different types of pools out there now too. So we're always used to the traditional uh, concrete cast in place or formed gunite type pools. But what we see increasing in our industry are these steel tanks. Now this one is a massive steel tank. This is on top of one of the hotel casinos in Las Vegas. And if you take a look at this, this is pretty impressive. Um, and it's really a simple installation, believe it or not. Um, obviously, everything has to meet deflection criteria. The conditions have to be good. But basically, it's a direct bond adhesive type with an epoxy adhesive. And then you grout it with an epoxy grout. And these types of uh, tanks are solid. You, you cannot get that tile off afterwards. And the benefits to these systems are that they're very lightweight in comparison to their concrete counterparts. So they're installed in places where you typically wouldn't see pools. They can also be hoisted and lifted into place after the fact uh, for renovation purposes. And the, the great part is it, is it greatly expands the opportunity to consume more tile. And that's what's interesting to all of us, right? Um, so I just wanted to highlight this. And this is, this is something that's very popular. And at some point, I hope that we can get some installation methods in the handbook uh, for this. I agree. Because it's, it's very, um, very popular and uh, very successful as well. Art, will you talk about cleaning it? Sure. So, so most of the steel tank manufacturers are going to have their own proprietary um, protocol, if you will, to clean it, right? They call it a pickling process or passivation. And it's basically just some sort of method that removes any form oils or fabrication oils is the right word. You know, because as they're, they're um, putting this together and they're welding it, there, there tends to be some residue from fabrication. So just follow their proprietary method of removing that and let it dry and you're good to go. I mean, it's, it's that simple. It, it is an important step. And, and the only other thing I'll mention is that 
where we run into some issues with stainless steel is, or can run into issues, is with trans, transparent glass. And, and, you know, sometimes the adhesives that we have to use for steel are not as white as we, what we typically want used with, with regular cement type pools. And so sometimes you can change the color of the glass. And, and that's another important thing to test if you're, if, if you're doing some mock-ups and things like that is how the adhesive may or may not affect the color of the glass. To shift the photo on you there, Art, uh, what are we looking at here? Okay, so, you know, we all have these, these great uh, photos of, of semi-catastrophes or, or major catastrophes in our, in our portfolios, right? So I, I wanted to just show this again, you know, we, we all been on the, on the movement joint issue, right? And, and that really is probably the most critical element in, in these applications. And, and we hear the argument all the time, well, once I fill my pool with water, nothing's gonna move. And, that, and that's right, you're, you're right. However, <laughs> in practice and in reality, these, these vessels, no matter what size they are, require maintenance of some sort. Maybe it's not even the tile that needs maintenance. So they're emptying the pools, refilling them, on and on and on. So this is a pretty large pool in a public recreation facility that had no movement joints in it at all. So guess what happens when you empty the pool? That, you know, so Jill um, mentioned about water drain and fill rates, right? I'll tell you that, that on the draining side, when you're draining a pool, that is really stressing the installation, especially if it's exterior. Because think about you're, you're leaving that entire weight of all that water very quickly. And especially if you're exterior, now the top surface is gonna dry out quickly when exposed to the sun, while the bottom layer remains saturated. You created a huge differential there. And what happens, you get pop-outs the tile will actually tent. That's what happened here in this application, no movement joints, the pool was drained very quickly and we got pop-outs. And now there's a membrane that's installed directly underneath the tile layer. Guess what that membrane is trying to do? That membrane is trying to accommodate that movement. It's like, oh no, there's a lot of stress here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it together but the membrane is probably the weakest point in this application. And when that stress builds up, you get these pop-outs. So this is another good example of why movement joints are so necessary in submerged applications. All right. How about this guy? So this is your more traditional heaving of tile, right? So this was down, uh, I think in, in Florida and, um, you know, look, look at how much, how much displacement is there. You can, you can put your hand in there, right? That was St. So, Thomas. Was it St. Thomas? Okay. Thanks, Dean. So maybe my colleague Dean uh, had to work on this project here. So look, look at what, what's at the surface here, right? At the edge between the coping, they put a, they put a flexible sealant joint there. So they probably thought, ah, oh, I'm, I'm doing this right. I put a movement joint at the coping to the wall, that's great. That's what should happen there. But there weren't any joints, even in the water line, which is about a foot deep, there weren't any movement joints that were placed periodically to help this dark cobalt blue tile sitting in the Caribbean sun from popping out. So again, illustrates how much movement a tile application can experience and the need for movement joints to be in place. Um, this was a steel tank that also did not have uh, proper movement joints. And so what happened is, is they buckled into the corners here. So if you see the, the vertical corner coming down and the two horizontals, there was no movement joint here. And it was the same argument, it's steel. How much movement is going to be experienced here? This thing isn't going anywhere. Um, the steel tank manufacturers want you, not maybe not you, the tile installer, but want the builder to pre-fill the tank before you tile it to, to somehow stretch it 
to make sure that it expands properly before you even tile it. So it's a fallacy that, that steel tanks don't move. They will also expand and contract and therefore you need proper movement uh, in these applications as well. And that's what happened here. Fortunately, it was a localized pop out and it wasn't destructive uh, across the board. And our last photo from you, Art. Okay, so, so my esteemed colleagues, Greg Shad mentioned this, Mike Michalizzi mentioned this, Jim Whitfield mentioned this. Um, when you're working in these projects, you know, especially outside, you can be in some pretty um, intense conditions, right? So this is one of our good builders who, who put this together, Southern California, in the sun, in the summer, it's 105 degrees uh, air temperature, but your surface temperature could be much greater than that. So you might have to tent the project Sometimes you might even have to cool it or heat it, depending on what extreme you're at. Um, the point is, is be cognizant of your environment. Um, the installation materials have a certain bandwidth of where they can work, right? And, and most of them top out at 90 degrees or 95 degrees, give or take. And if you're above those temperatures, you can experience some pretty serious issues if we're not controlling the climate that we're working in. So for the tile installer, there's no way you can carry this in your budget and be competitive, right? So this requires negotiation. It requires some sort of dialogue with your pool builders and with your general contractors to make sure they put you in, in a good place to be successful or else you could have, you know, a lot of challenging issues on your hands. So this was just a good example of a, of a tented pool and the conditions in here were much better than what they could have been without protection. That is some incredible information right there. Um, Mike DeGiusti. Yes, sir. Do you uh, have anything to add before we segue over to our Ask the Ref game? Um, I just want to add that in my opinion, it's so critical for the tile contractor to get with whichever setting material people he's going to use, do a job site visit, make sure everyone's on the same page, address the stuff we've heard about hot, cold, control joints, because they're not going to be given to you by the builder. So you'll have to decide where they're going to go and just make sure everyone's on the same page and use an entire system so that you get a nice warranty. Absolutely. Any of our panelists uh, wish to, to comment? Hi, uh, it's Brett, Mark. Um, Brett. You know, this is not necessarily a submerged environment in the sense, but when we're talking about the glass mosaics and what type of, you know, McLeese was talking about the, the, the glues or the resins on the back or the whether what type of mounts they are. Um, I've always considered it a semi-submerged area and I always have my contractors that I'm talking to um, definitely take those precautions for shower pans. Great advice. Shower pans see a lot of water. <laughs> and if it's the Brady Bunch and it's one shower in the house, it's never drying out. That's right. And it's in the house. Yep. Yeah, in the structure. Okay, uh, anybody, anything else to add? Next time, so we'll right. have it. Uh, and I want to personally thank um, uh, Gilles Bignolis from Ladacrete, uh, Greg Shad, Tech HB Fuller, Brett Monty, Brett Monty from Mercury, Mark Penine from Ardex, Mike Michalizzi, Custom Building Products, Jim Whitfield, from Mape, Art Minty from Ladacrete, and our NTCA Region 8 Director, Mike DeGiusti. Mike, do you have any words of wisdom for us before we leave? Um, with all everything that's going on in the world, COVID, et cetera, the backyard business is growing like crazy. Every market I know is busy. It's a great opportunity for contractors to 
tile swimming pools, fountains, backyards, because people seem to have money. Uh, our crews and everyone I sell to around a five state region, it, we're just having banner years last year and this year already they're booked up outdoor kitchens. So take advantage of it, market yourself for these outdoor pools and fountains done correctly. Your profit margins are far more than regular job sites. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we will have another round table in a couple of weeks. Watch for your text system for updates. Come back. We'd love to have you again. See you, everyone. Have a Bye, great everyone. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Take care, guys. Bye.